Yes, um, thank you, Jaudine, for joining us today at, uh, in, this, in this lecture space in this rather extraordinary time mm -hmm. uh, to share with us her work and experiences. Um, as the co-founder and director of Architects for Social Housing and as a senior lecturer at the Leicester School of Architecture running a design studio and teaching professional practices and ethics, Geraldine has taken on one of the most complex, urgent and troubled issue of our time, the issue of social housing. For many years, with sheer commitment and spanning between diligent research, communication and design, developing modes of dialogue and strategies of inclusive incremental changes involving residents, officials and specialists. In 2018, Geraldine was named by the Evening Standard newspaper as one of London's 30 most influential architects. And with Architects as Social Housing co-founder Simon Elmer, she is working on a book title for a socialist architecture. Recent projects with Architects for Social Housing includes design and feasibility studies and additional housing, improving six council and social housing estates, uh, particularly in London, that's threatened with demolition. Um, yes. Thanks, Geraldine. Great. Um, yeah, so hello to everybody at the AA Projective Cities Programme, and thank you very much to Doreen um, for inviting me to talk to you today. Can everybody, everybody can hear me fine, yeah? Yes, all good. Great. Um, so I'll just kick off. Um, so the urban conditions that we've been witnessing and responding to in London over the past five years are a direct result of a global phenomenon of the privatisation, marketization, and financialization of housing, the neoliberalization of our processes of development, and the consequent decimation and destruction of our urban communities, environments, and cultures in favor of short-term financial gain and increasing inequality. Simultaneously, the issue of sustainable cities and how we can develop sustainably is one of the most urgent issues of our time, and one in which architects and built environment professionals have both the opportunity and the duty to take a leading role. The recent awareness about the need for environmental sustainability is welcome. However, genuinely sustainable, just and equitable development must go far beyond the simplistic notions of so-called green architecture. Architectural approaches must not only improve the physical, built and natural environments in which we live, but also be socially beneficial and financially viable if we are to call them truly sustainable. <clears throat> when Architects for Social Housing was created in 2015, we were not responding to a theoretical question of urban sustainability, but to the immediate social, economic and environmental realities of the destruction of some of the only remaining social housing in London and the consequences of this for the existing communities, as well as the longer term structural issues the loss of such housing was and is creating. The chart here is something we created as part of a residency in Vancouver, Canada last summer from which emerged the title of the publication for a socialist architecture. Unlike the capitalist economy and architecture, which prioritizes the financial context above all else and measures and apportions the world in these terms and these terms alone, a sustainable economy and a sustainable architecture must address all of the constituent contexts, the social, the environmental, the economic and political as essential, equal, intersecting and overlapping parts of the totality. There are endless reports from the building industry on how we must address climate change within the technical requirements of new buildings, but this doesn't address the more systemic questions of why we build in the first place and for who. Architecture is an industry, a very powerful one, and the motivations behind building are many, but the motivations of a capitalist architecture are almost entirely financial, not social or environmental. A capitalist system is based on extraction and profit, compared to a sustainable and circular economy based on reuse and minimizing waste. If we're going to achieve anything like a sustainable building industry, if this is in any way possible, then we must address and challenge the very fundamental assumptions and principles on which our industry is based. It is our contemporary economic structure, that of monopoly capitalism, which is at the root of unsustainable development. And so in order to create any kind of really sustainable development, we need to challenge the economic and political structures in and around the development process, the processes involved in the production of architecture and the social and economic relations embedded within each and every project and practice. This is the reason the title of our latest publication is For a Socialist Architecture. I want to make it clear that by a socialist architecture, we don't mean the architecture of the past, of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, 
of the Eastern Bloc in Europe, of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, of the People's Republic of China, of the centrally planned city of Chandigarh in the Republic of India, of the post-colonial federal capital of Brasilia in the Fourth Republic of Brazil, of the national art schools in the post-revolutionary Republic of Cuba, or even the post-war architecture of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That doesn't mean these historical examples of socialist architecture don't offer us models from which we can learn and take. And what we're interested in producing is an equitable, just and sustainable architecture of the future, which we call a socialist architecture, whose principles we need to start practicing in the present if it is ever to be brought into existence. So what are the constituent contexts of the built environment and how must they relate if we are to produce such a socially beneficial, environmentally sustainable and economically viable architecture? The social, we must situate architecture within the totality of relations of its production, distribution, exchange and consumption and propose new equ equitable and just practices for a socialist architecture under capitalism. The environmental, we must understand and reduce the totality of consumption within the finitude of global resources. The economic, we must design for and implement economic degrowth within the context of global housing demand. The political, we must reclaim the political and social dimension of architecture to affect policy change. In the UK right now and across capitalist democracies, the environment has become a large framework for thinking about what we want or have to do with the world uh, and how or if we are going to continue into the future. The environment is another word we can understand for what we mean here by the totality. At the moment, the primary way in which the architectural profession is responding to its contribution to the continuing rise of carbon emissions around the world is through, as I mentioned before, photovoltaic panels, improved insulation, green roofs and walls, etc. Technical solutions, in other words. What it rarely, if ever, considers the is the environmental cost of construction or demolition on the local eco ecosystem, or the social costs of the tenure types and sale prices of the residential dwellings it is designing, or the economic costs to both residents and the public sector of doing so, or the political agendas it is serving. In other words, architectural discourse is isolating the environment, in inverted commas, from the totality of relations in which architecture exists, which includes its social, economic and political dimensions. So I'm now going to briefly illustrate some of the urban contexts and practices of development in London that we've been facing um, and then discuss some of the practices we've put into place and the principles we have extracted from these. Um, unlike more architecturally intact European cities like Paris, as a result of both the war and 20th century planning policies, London has historically been a socially diverse city of neighbourhoods, rich and poor next to each other. However, over the past few decades, as a result of the financialization of land and more specifically housing, the land on which these poorer communities are housed in the form of inner city council estates is becoming more and more valuable. Profits made from the sale of such land and its redevelopment is not being captured and reinvested in that land or in the local community, but extracted within an economic system that celebrates the movement of capital into fewer and fewer hands. Like agricultural land, <clears throat> which is stripped of nutrients, developers are farming at our cities, reducing them to investment opportunities to be profited from and mined purely for their capital rather than social or cultural spaces to be actually lived in. In order to capture the financial value, all other forms of value must be denied. The marketization of housing takes something which has a use value and subordinates that use value to exchange value stripping it of all other values or qualities which accompany that use, such as fulfilling a social need, any environmental qualities of the existing property, and any, any impact of its destruction. The land must be emptied of residents, stripped of their provision or amenities for public or, or common good, demolished, redeveloped, and privatized. These residents who are moved out of the inner cities are more often than not unable to afford the increased costs to move back into the redeveloped areas so are obliged to leave their families, communities and social networks. This is destroying the social fabric of our inner cities. And as a result, this form of development that is taking place in London is what we call social cleansing. Through this vast transfer of public land into private hands, this process facilitated in the UK by the Estate Regeneration Programme 
diminishes publicly owned assets and therefore further reduces public access to parts of the city, to fundamental amenities such as parks, open spaces and community facilities. This is a direct cause of spatial, economic and environmental inequality and is clearly unsustainable. In addition, in order to facilitate this privatisation, the, the demolition of perfectly good buildings, infrastructure, public amenities and assets such as housing is in and of itself deeply unsustainable economically, not only in terms of the vast amounts of embodied carbon, which is locked in the existing, often masonry structures, but the byproducts of demolition such as dust and other pollutants and simply the vast amount of waste most of which goes direct to landfill before we, even, before we even count the costs of construction. So the current approach to urban development is based on a range of fundamental principles, which are commonly accepted and which are at the heart of the problem. So the three main ones are, number one, that attracting investment in UK residential property from the private sector, including foreign investors, overseas buyers and offshore financial jurisdictions should be the primary source of revenue for house building. Number two, that according to the law of supply and demand, massively increasing the number of residential properties for market sale will reduce house prices in general. And three, that the sale of prime and super prime residential properties for the highest possible market price will cross subsidise the provision of so-called affordable housing the rest of the population can afford to rent or buy. Now, these are all false um, because, firstly, private investment in the property market has qualitatively transformed housing into a global commodity, with investors, for example, speculating on shares in the value uplift consequent upon planning permission being granted on a piece of land they will never see and which may never even be developed. Secondly, because the law of supply and demand doesn't describe this property market in which use value is no longer relevant and the financialization by global cap capital has driven prices up as it is intended to, not down. And thirdly, far from cross subsidizing affordable housing, housing, let alone homes for social rent, private investment is instead funding the demolition of public housing and the sale of public land for the development of primary market sale properties. So going to just a few statistics here. So just as a little illustration of the, some of the financial impacts of the current system, between 2005 and 2014, so again, this is still quite a while ago now, uh, at least £170 billion worth of UK property was acquired by companies registered to offshore financial jurisdictions. The real owners of more than half of the 44,000 UK land titles registered to overseas companies are unidentified. But nine out of ten of the properties were purchased through tax havens. In the second half of 2018, overseas investors purchased 57% of all homes in central London. Only a quarter of the residential properties with planning permission in London between 2017 and 2021 will meet current housing price and tenure demand. The total number of unsold new build properties in London on sale for more than £1 million has hit a record high of 3,000 units. Of the 45 and a half thousand residential properties completed in London between 2016 to 17, only 5% were for social rent. <clears throat> and some more <laughs> devastating um, data statistics here. Um, the total value of the UK housing stock in 2018 was £7.29 trillion, pounds, having risen by a third over the last decade alone. This is equivalent to 3.45 times the gross domestic product of the UK and more than 62% of the UK's entire net wealth of 11.63 trillion. It's extraordinarily powerful uh, um, industry. 72% of the increase in the value of UK housing stock in 2018, some 137.7 billion pounds, was due to house prices going up with only 28% of that increase coming from new properties being built. Property wealth, in other words, is not coming from an increase in housing production, but from an inflation in house prices caused by market speculation and government subsidies, such as help to buy and equity loans. In 2016, the 10 largest house builders in the UK were sitting on land with planning permission to, sufficient to build 404,000 new residential properties, as well as holding agreements with landowners on enough land to build another 480,000. 
yet between them they built less than 30,000 new dwellings that year so that's less than 10 percent eight percent something like that despite this or rather because of it the pre-tax profits of the four largest uk builders rose from just under 419 million pounds in 2011 to over 2.6 billion pounds in 2016 that's a more than six-fold increase in just five years the largest builder per simon cleared one billion pounds profit in 2018 there's a direct correlation, therefore, between housing supply and the profits being made from it. But it is not based on flooding the market with low cost housing. This is an ongoing project to locate and document every London estate under threat of, currently undergoing or which has recently undergone regeneration, whether that's privatisation, typically in a stock transfer to a housing association, refurbishment, usually with the prior decanting of the residents who as with the Balfour Tower you may have known about, do not return, or demolition, either partial or full, with the resulting loss uh, of homes for social rent and the social cleansing of the existing estate community. Red pins indicate the states on the 21 labour run boroughs, by which by the time of the exhibition we'd located 196 estates. This was in uh, August 2017, so it's three years ago now. Blue pins in the uh, 10 conservative run boroughs, which have 37 estates, and yellow in the Lib Dem uh, run borough of Sutton, which had five estates um, at that point. So that was a total of 238 estates in 2017. It's a huge amount of people who are going to be affected by this and a loss of thousands, hundreds of thousands of social rented homes. More than 165,000 homes for social rent were lost in England just six years between 2012 and 2018, according to the Chartered Institute of Housing, and the 320,000 homeless in the UK. Um, I think it's important to note that these figures will always be lower than the true figure, partly because in the case of estate demolition, the total number of homes lost is only counted at the end. And most of these projects last more than 20 years, so none of these figures on here will uh, include any of the current council estate demolition programmes or even uh, pro projects like the Haygate, which uh, started many, many years ago, but which is still not finished. So at the same time, uh, as a part of the redevelopment process, we're witnessing the replacement of social rent, the lowest rental tenure, uh, with what is called affordable rent, which it sums up to 80% of a market rent is anything but affordable, resulting in the fact that cities like London are becoming impossible to live in for the poorer sections of society, who either have to endure longer and longer commutes to get to work, or poorer and more expensive living conditions, or in many cases forced to move out of London altogether. This is a, this is a hypothetical diagram from a cost of estate regeneration report that we produced uh, last year, um, which is uh, based on the analysis of the regeneration of a number of existing estates, which describes the tenure transformation of a typical estate um, and the loss of social housing and its replacement with properties for market rent or sale. So originally 100 households, um, 70 of which um, are council tenanted uh, with social, for social rent, um, all of that red uh, ends up um, disappearing altogether um, because there is no provision for social rent housing um, anymore. So just briefly, um, affordable housing, what is affordable housing? Just to give a very brief example, the range of what is deemed affordable makes a mockery of the English language. Uh, social rent, um, this, is, this is an example of uh, a Brent, um, a social rent on average here, 106 for a two bedroom uh, residential property, 106 pounds. London affordable rent, which as you can see from the previous slide, is what is being re uh, re replaced here, is 59% um, uh, increase and the London living rent is 125% increase of um, from the social rent. So uh, the idea that these are somehow affordable um, is absurd. And this is an example, one of the estates we're working with at the moment, an adjacent estate, which is the South Kilburn estate. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the examples of some of the marketing literature being produced for the sale of the properties on the regenerated South Kilburn estate. When we show this to residents in St. Raphael's estate, they were um, stunned and disbelieving um, at the, the level of income which uh, newcomers to their, to, their, to their estate would be expected to provide joint income of 
150 to 250 thousand pounds is what you would be expected to, to have to be able to buy onto the to the new redeveloped estate. And um, <clears throat> some of you, hopefully, most of you will have heard about the Haygate estate situated in London in Zone One. It's one of the most well documented estates, which is why um, um, we keep on using the uh, the uh, um, the images. Um, built in 1974 and demolished between 2011 and 14. The original 1,214 homes were replaced with 2,535, so around double, which sounds like a good thing. But only 82 of those 2,500 were for social rent. The rest formed various forms of affordable and mainly market sale. And in 2017, Transparency International stated that 100% of South Gardens, which is one of the estates um, on the Haygate, um, which have been, have been sold to overseas buyers, 100%. Um, and uh, on the right here, you can see where um, the original residents um, ended up having to move to, um, being unable to afford to move back to the redeveloped Haygate estate. <clears throat> so I've given a brief but reasonably detailed introduction to the urban, economic, uh, political and social context within which we work. And now I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction to who we are. Um, Architects for Social Housing, or ASH, uh, was set up in March 2015 in order to respond architecturally to London's housing crisis. We're a community interest company that organises working collectives of architects, urban designers, engineers, surveyors, planners, filmmakers, photographers, artists, writers and housing campaigners for individual projects. Tailored to meet specific needs, these collectives operate with developing ideas under set principles. First among these is the conviction that increasing the housing capacity on existing council estates, rather than redeveloping them as properties for capital investment, is a more sustainable solution to London's housing needs than the demolition of the city's social housing during a housing shortage, enabling, as it does, the continued existence of the communities they house. ASH offers support, advice and expertise to residents who feel their interests and voices are being marginalised by local councils or housing associations during the so-called regeneration process. Our primary responsibility is to existing residents, tenants and leaseholders alike, but we are also committed to finding financially, socially and environmentally viable alternatives to estate demolition that are in the interests of the wider London community. So ASH operates on three levels of activity, architecture, community and propaganda. We propose architectural alternatives to estate demolition schemes through designs for infill, roof extensions and refurbishment that increase housing capacity on the estates by up to 50%, and by renting a portion of the new homes on the private market, generate the funds to refurbish the existing council homes while leaving the communities they currently house intact. We support estate communities in their resistance to the demolition of their homes by working with residents over a period of time, <clears throat> providing, with a, with a, providing them with information about estate regeneration and housing policy from a reservoir of knowledge and tactics pulled from similar campaigns across London. And we share information that aims to correct unfounded statements and counter negative perceptions about social housing in the minds of the public and raise awareness of the role of relevant interest groups, including political parties, local authorities, housing associations, property developers, real estate firms and architectural practices in the regeneration process. Using a variety of means, including publications, presentations, reports, case studies, exhibitions, films and protests, we're trying to initiate policy change within UK housing. So over the past five years, we've worked with residents on seven council and social housing estate demolition projects and supported dozens of other residents threatened with the demolition of their homes. These wholesale redevelopment projects are typically carried out by local authorities or housing associations who are the owners, landlords and managers of the UK social housing and their demolition is resulting in loss of tens of thousands of council and social rented homes. These design alternatives to demolition that ASH has produced demonstrate that we can increase the density of the existing housing estates by up to 50% without any demolition, and that the funds from the sale or rent of a portion of the new homes can fund the refurbishment of the existing homes, landscape, and any necessary improvements to the community facilities. So this is the first project I'll be talking about. Um, this is Central Hill Estate in Crystal Palace, Lambeth, South London. Uh, it was designed between 1966 and 1974 uh, and was the subject of a number of awards following its construction. It contains 700, sorry, 476 dwellings that are home to approximately 1,200 residents, 
In 2016, the estate was condemned to demolition by Lambeth Council, and since then has been awaiting some form of redevelopment by Homes for Lambeth, a council-owned commercial venture financed by private investment partners. The most recent regeneration scheme would result in the permanent loss of 340 secure council tenancy homes for social rent in a borough of 28,000 people on the housing waiting list. Some of the drawings of the original estate, uh, it's very cleverly integrated into the landscape with a democracy of views, every maisonette having a view of London to the north uh, and a courtyard to the south. Uh, the whole estate works very closely with the existing landscape and um, peppered with trees and maximises its position on the steep hillside. So one of the principles of a, sustain, a sustainable socialist architecture is the, uh, that the architectural product is not separated from those that produce it and occupy it. As a result, the process by which the architecture is designed, procured, constructed and managed is fundamental to that which is being produced. On all of our projects, therefore, and Central Hill is no exception, the residents are our clients, not the landlords. And it is the residents and local communities needs that we are designing for, not for profit. These are two images of some of our exhibitions and an event we organised called Open Garden Estates, as Estates, which residents hosted on 12 estates across London for three years. One of the reasons there's such little resistance to the demolition of our council housing is the stigma and prejudice associated with it. On the left is a photograph tweeted by a councillor at that time, head of housing, now the cabinet member for planning, investment and new homes, Matthew Bennett uh, at Lambeth, suggesting that the homes need to be demolished because of mould. On the right was an image tweeted by uh, PRP, Lambeth's architects for the demolition scheme, with the quoting, would you walk down this alleyway? Such negative stereotyping and prejudice is endemic and insidious and has a profound influence on the way our society perceives our cities. We must expose and challenge the role of such accepted narratives and demand the recognition of different sets of values of use value over profit. Who is telling these stories and whose benefits are they for? Could you live on this estate? Trapped in a concrete jungle, surrounded by monotonous grey facades, isolated by poorly lit walkways, in homes with no individuality, caught in a poverty trap, a haven for crime and drug dealing, with gangs of kids roaming the streets. So on, the, on that basis, we um, worked with the residents to come up with a proposal for refurbishment and infill. Um, the refurbishment of all 476 dwellings, which included external insulation, green roofs, the overhaul of ventilation and services, new doors and windows, we reinstated the green fingered walkways. As I said, this is a very kind of green estate which worked with the landscape, um, looking to retain all the existing trees and increase the biodiversity of what is in fact a green corridor moving through that part of South London. Uh, reuse and repurpose the existing unused buildings on the estate and uh, design infill housing and roof extensions which would provide approximately 240 new dwellings with at least half of these for social rent. So the first one, uh, this is an example, this would be the boiler block, uh, which is a conversion of the old boiler block site to a new block of flats with community run workshops on the ground floors. Um, the idea was to retain the existing chimneys to create a new entrance to the site, but which would remember and celebrate the past. Um, this was called, known as fringe housing. This is uh, housing all the way around the estate. Um, this is an opportunity to build new housing along the main road, which runs alongside the estate. This would provide both a new street edge to the estate and to facilitate access into the estate from the steep hill, which also addresses various criticisms that the estate is inward looking, inaccessible and not integrated into the wider neighbourhood. All those criticisms can be addressed by sensitive uh, interventions um, in the existing uh, city fabric. These are some of the roof extensions that we propose to so the low rise maisonettes. So we have sort of four stories of low rise maisonettes running around the outside um, and additional one to two stories of, uh, uh, of new roof extensions would incorporate pitch roofs and roof gardens, which would break up 
the mass, reducing the impact uh, on the rest of the estate. And we also demonstrated that the existing maze nets were able to be extended, therefore adding additional rooms and floor space. One of the key components of a future-proofed and therefore sustainable architecture is the ability to be modified. Um, and we demonstrated through a very simple exercise here, uh, a way in which you could increase um, these maze nets by adding additional room or additional floor space. Um, so this was our final proposal, which shows uh, the different infill um, running mainly around the outside edge of the estate, and similarly the roof extensions to minimise the impact um, on the existing estate. Um, we also um, obviously proposed improving the existing landscape um, and reproviding the communal facilities which have been removed uh, as part of the uh, um, managed decline of the estate. So looking at refurbishment versus demolition, this slide compares the latest Lambeth scheme versus the Ash scheme and shows that although the Lambeth scheme increases the number of homes by around 300%, the number of additional social rented homes will be potentially reduced to zero. So the Ash scheme, even though there will not be as many overall homes, there will be more social rented homes. So it will do more to address the demonstrable need for additional social rented homes in Lambeth. The orange here is for London affordable rent, which in the new tenor uh, now effectively replaces social rent, which I mentioned before, uh, but which is on average 60% higher. Um, so there is no social rent home in the new council proposal uh, whatsoever. And here's the financial argument. Um, as a result of the cost of demolition, which equates to approximately £50,000 per home, which is in fact almost the same as the cost of refurbishment per home, the approximate costs to build the ash proposal and refurbish the existing homes, which is, results in 780 new and upgraded dwellings, would come to around 17, uh, sorry, 97 million pounds. That's the figure at the top there. But the cost to Lambeth to build that many new homes in the full demolition scheme is approximately 245 million pounds. That's the one construction, 718 dwellings. That's over three and a half times what our scheme would cost to provide the same number of homes. Financially, that simply doesn't make sense. Chris Joffer, lead, uh, building uh, retrofit leader at Arups, said, even if you build a super efficient home, it could take 30 years before you address the balance associated with demolition. So if we are to begin to achieve any kind of carbon reductions within the building industry by 2050, which is now 30 years away. The only way to achieve this is by not demolishing. We commissioned an environmental engineering company called Model Environments, who clarified that um, some of the embodied carbon environmental costs of de demolition. Um, the office of the London Mayor set a target to reduce London's carbon dioxide emissions by 60% based on 1990 levels by 2025. That's in five years. And homes are responsible for 36% of London's uh, carbon emissions. The concrete industry is one of the world's two largest producers of greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. And about half of the emissions come directly from the heating of limestone in its manufacture. And around 40% are emissions associated with burning fuel. A significant fraction of the carbon emissions the building will make over its lifetime is locked into the fabric by the time the building is constructed. As improvements in efficiency reduce carbon emissions from energy in, in the operational phase, increasing attention is being given to the issue of embodied carbon, examination of which can provide cost-effective carbon savings. When a building is demolished, there are carbon emissions from the energy used in the deconstruction, removal and dispersal, disposal of the waste. There may also be CO2 emissions released by chemical processes as the building fabric is broken up. Green roofs, photovoltaic panels, external insulation, improved thermal performance and the reduced energy consumption of modern buildings are not enough to offset the environmental impact of demolition and redevelopment. The environmental sustainability of housing needs to be taken as a totality. It takes decades for the more environmentally efficient buildings one might expect to be built on new developments to recoup the environmental costs of demolition and redevelopment. Modern environments then calculated the embodied energy sequestered in the existing buildings. A conservative estimate for the embodied carbon of Central Hill Estate that we've just looked at will be around 7,000 tonnes of CO2e. 
There was a similar emissions to those from heating 600 detached homes for a year using electric heating, or the emissions savings made by the London Mayor's retrofitting scheme in a year and a quarter. For the demolition phase, a conservative estimate of three months, 480 hours, with four excavators using 30 litres of diesel per hour equals 57,600 litres. A conversion factor of 2.68 kilograms uh, suggests a figure of approximately 154 tonnes of CO2. Annual domestic emissions per capita in Lambeth were 1.8 tonnes in 2012. Therefore, the emissions associated with the demolition of Central Hill Estate equate to the annual emissions of over 4,000 Lambeth residents. Other environmental impacts from the demolition, such as air pollution and water pollution, should be considered in further studies. So the crucial conclusion we were able to draw and demonstrate following our research and work at Central Hill Estate was that demolition is financially, socially and environmentally unsustainable. Refurbishment enables the continuation of existing communities structurally dispersed by demolition, as well as the maintenance of existing ecosystems otherwise destroyed by redevelopment. Refurbishment improves internal environment and residents' living conditions, health, health and well-being, reduces energy use, therefore financial costs and fuel poverty, as well as the environmental costs of production, retains embodied carbon in existing buildings. Refurbishment minimises dust particles and other carbon-related air, water and noise pollutants. Refurbishment minimises waste production, removal and containment. Refurbishment is cheaper than demolition and rebuilding, so allows for funds to be reallocated according to the principles of a socialist architecture. Refurbishment has the minimum impact environmentally, as well as financially and socially on existing residents and local communities. Refurbishment retains the heritage of the existing communities, whether that heritage is judged to be of high value or not. For us, it is primarily the use value that is of importance and of supporting existing cultural activities and communities. Following a five-year master planning exercise, which cost Lambeth over a million pounds in consultancy fees, the council has decided not to proceed with their regeneration proposals and currently is considering infill and refurbishment. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, so for the second project, I'm going to talk about um, West Kensington and Gibbs Green Estate located in Hammersmith and Fulham within the Earl's Court and West Kensington Opportunity Area. It's on the left there of your, in your screen, just surrounded by a little red box. Um, so in parallel with our work at Central Hill, in summer 2015, we were approached by residents of West Ken and Gibbs Green Estates in West London, whose homes were under threat of demolition by the developer Capco, to whom Hammersmith and Fulham Council had sold the estates in 2009. So this is the master plan. The proposals which Capco's architect Terry Farrell, Terry Farrell produced consisted of the wholesale uh, demolition of the two estates. So on the left there you can see that the estates are to the left of um, what is in fact Earls Court Station um, and Earls Court um, uh, Exhibition Hall. So the estates are on the left of that image on the left. Um, the residents were not offered the right to return to the land, which was their home and the site of their communities, but they were at best offered parcel, flats in parcels of land which had been earmarked for the affordable housing component across the borough, and at worst, in the cases of leaseholders and freeholders, faced the prospect of having to move out of London altogether due to the difference in price between what they would be offered for their existing home and the prices of the new proposed flats. Ash were asked to produce a document called the People's Plan for an alternative to demolition which would enable community control and development of the estates. This was part of the uh, estate's application for the right to transfer the estates into their own community ownership via what is called right to transfer section 34A of the 1985 Housing Act under a community land trust. Um, what you told us, so part of our work was about understanding how the existing estate works and what could be improved from the perspective of the people who live there and understand their needs. As with any parts of the city, there is always room for improvement, so our task was to learn from the residents how they could imagine improvements to the landscape, community facility, pay, play spaces, etc. What was important about this, um, which was a large poster which kept on growing as the project went on, um, was seeing their own words uh, um, shown back to them. This is what they told us and this is what this is our kind of uh, um, key document that we used. So as a way to understand how the estate works, residents drew their paths for us, regular routes they took from their homes to other places on and off the estate to help us get to know the estate and how it operates. In terms of the landscape and public realm, access and circulation, 
we observed and documented the way residents used the estate. Identifying some of the spatial opportunities and constraints of the existing public realm. And finally, we located a set of opportunities, both for improvements to the landscape and community facilities, as well as for additional housing. The idea being that the proposals could simultaneously improve the estate at the same time as increasing its density. So, um, and finally we located, so following around six months of engagement and the number of design workshops with over 200 residents, Ash identified the possibility for 327 new homes on the estate without demolition. And that's a 45% increase in housing capacity. The proposals included roof extensions in pink and infill housing in yellow as before. The refurbishment of all the existing homes and improvements to the landscape and communal facilities on the estate. So the refurbishment of all 760 dwellings with external insulation, green roofs, ventilation services, new doors and windows, uh, which would result in lower energy costs, reduced fuel poverty and uh, the elimination of coal bridging. And roof extensions and new lifts, balconies and winter gardens, winter gardens are added to the existing tower blocks, as you can see in the image there. New community hall and children's play spaces, community allotments and tree planting initiatives, as well as sustainable urban drainage. The proposals would enable residents in under-occupied homes to move to a new, smaller infill home on the estate, something like potentially supported accommodation. This could then free up those larger homes for overcrowded families. There's an option for repurposing the unused garages as workshops for not-for-profit workspaces to support small resident-run businesses. And through the right to, transfer, right to transfer, residents could transfer their estate into their own ownership as a community land trust. Through cross-subsidy, the sale or rent of a proportion of the new dwellings would pay for the construction of all the new dwellings, as well as refurbishment and improvements to the rest of the estate. The leaseholder's share of the costs would be funded by this community land trust as equity until sale. Funding would be raised from long-term ethical investor partners, as well as government subsidies for the new builds, but there are still no subsidies to refurbish, and VAT on refurbishment is 20% versus 0% on new build, which is something that we need to be addressing in order to uh, facilitate some of these sort of projects. So as of November last year, uh, 2019, it was, it was announced that following six years of campaigning, Hammersmith and Fulham Council had bought back West Kensington and Gibbs Green Estates from the developer, Capco, saving the homes from demolition. The residents are now fighting for community ownership and are working with the mayor's office on proposals for developing part of the site the people's plan having been fundamental in helping them to formulate their vision for the estates. So as a result of this work over the past five years, researching into the effects of the estate regeneration programme and development practices on London's housing market and producing designs for alternatives to the demolition of their homes, we've come to a number of conclusions and a set of principles and practices which we presented last summer uh, at our residency in Vancouver, which we entitled for a socialist architecture. Our observations come from the analysis of the city and its development from these four different perspectives or contexts, the social, the environmental, the economic and political. The primary principle that each of these sections is a totality, which also contains the others. In other words, we cannot talk of the economy without talking about society and the environment. And so to talk about a sustainable city or a sustainable economy or a sustainable environment, one must address each of these contexts simultaneously and most importantly, their interrelationships. The built environment cannot be separated from the people who produce it and inhabit it. The environmental context of a socialist and sustainable architecture means understanding and reducing the totality of consumption within the finitude of global resources. We need to make a commitment to reducing carbon emissions and to policies of economic degrowth, which is inevitably also a socialist and sustainable concern, not least because damage to the environment has enormous collective social and economic consequences which are disproportionately borne by the poorest members of our societies, and of which the fiscal policies of austerity are the most recent example. Under capitalism, the global consequences of expansion are not estimated in individual project costs, but deferred, manifesting themselves in the health and social well-being of future generations, and in contributions to the long-term degradation of the degradation of the global environment. And while maintaining that only a socialist and sustainable economy can hope to reorder the relations of production to environmentally and socially sustainable levels of consumption, 
And so socialist and sustainable architecture must seek to offset, resist and challenge the unsustainable growth on which capitalism depends for its profits and which is the economic cause of the global crisis of housing affordability. In a city like London, where 80% of the homes and buildings that will be occupied in 2050 are already constructed, refurbishment, socially, financially and environmentally, is by far and away the most sustainable means of development. We simply cannot afford to do anything else. If we start to look more closely at the development processes, which we have identified as critical in the production of a socialist architecture, for an architecture or urban development to be truly sustainable, it must also never displace existing communities, be designed, produced, procured and constructed by or in collaboration with the local community, be not for profit, contribute to improving the environment, health and well-being of existing residents, enact and promote the principles and practices of economic degrowth, meet the housing and communal needs of the population, encourage low impact and healthy living and increase environmental, social and political engagement and awareness. So in conclusion, the connection we've drawn between capitalist architectural practice and unsustainability seems to be clear. What we want to replace it with should not come down to a difficulty with the use or history of a word, socialist. This is the word we've chosen, which we feel best describes the kind of architectural practice we believe needs to take place for changes to the social, environmental, economic and political structures to happen. Some of the questions we all need to ask are, what sort of architecture do we want to produce? Who produces it? For whom is it produced? How is it produced? And what value do its products have? A sustainable architecture is one that engages with the totality of its social, economic and environmental contexts and is, because of this, socially, environmentally and economically sustainable. A sustainable architecture is produced by and for those who do and will inhabit it not as a commodity for those who want to buy and sell it. A sustainable architecture is one that meets the housing and civic needs of its citizens. A sustainable architecture is never produced for profit, but in order to meet those needs. Its value, therefore, is always its use value as housing or other asset of community value, never its exchange value as property. A sustainable socialist architecture cannot be separated from the process of its production, including its funding, procurement, design, construction, maintenance, use and reuse. These processes, which for a socialist architecture take precedence over the purely formal and material qualities of the architectural object endlessly fetishised in architectural magazines, extend back before and continue beyond the production of a building. A sustainable and socialist architecture is produced collectively by everybody, by those who pay for it and those who inhabit it, by those who design it, those who build it, those who use it, by those who argue, lobby and legislate for it, by those who manage it, those who maintain it and those who refurbish it, those who dismantle and those who reconfigure it. These are all the agents of a sustainable and socialist architecture. And I hope that you might all be one of them. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll ask the first question, and I'd like to also invite the audience to um uh, to to take opportunity to have a dialogue with uh, Geraldine about a number of really um, powerful ideas that she's uh, framing. Um, I think the um the notion of a possible collective form is something very central to um, um, to the way we teach and then the way we um, explore with students through their uh, research and design projects. Um, and then also this uh, um, this idea of a totality of the environment, which is not just about the building per se, but it's a consideration of um, uh, the wider built environment, but then also the uh, process uh, uh, prior to it and uh, and into the post occupancy mm -hmm. and uh, an impact beyond, let's say, the site boundary. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, uh, really crucial to um, uh, to delineate 
Um, and then also I, I, I really enjoy the idea of how you um, talk about the user as client. It's, it's kind of there is there shouldn't be a differentiation, which we, we so commonly in sort of the, these sort of bubble diagrams that we are sort of accustomed to. The client is something and the user is something else and then the designer is something and then the builder is something else. Mm -hmm. And I think by contesting those the kind of the, the simple work relations, and who sets the requirements and who responds to it and then who actually draw something and who actually builds something and the role starts to shift um, in your new work diagram and I just it would be really great if you can explain a bit further how you work mm -hmm. uh, let's say from uh, project to project and um, uh, do you form a new team mm -hmm. uh, based on the situation or there is some kind of ongoing dialogue that passes or even a work relation uh, with specialists that goes for, move from project to project yeah, I mean, to look at the first issue, the sort of nature of the collective, um, the projects that we get are very diverse. So um, and they could and so it very much depends on the need um, as to who works on them. So, I mean, at the moment we're working on a project at West, uh, sorry, to, uh, St. Raphael's estate up in Brent. And this is a uh, where we're designing alternative to demolition. And so the architectural need is very high. So for that, we have um, between sort of 10 to 20 architects or uh, you know architectural people with ex architectural expertise who are um, helping us in some way with that project and are, are working on that project and the key thing that we've always felt is that people should be uh, uh, working on well particularly because this is not paid this is all pro bono work essentially um, is that people should be um, able to choose what is the area that interests them so if, you know we might sort of say well okay look you know if you're interested in sustainable materials you could go off and do some research into sustainable construction, for example. Uh, one guy um, got, when he came to one of the meetings, uh, met one of the residents and got really interested in her story. So he's now um, going to be telling a story of this terrace of houses um, mm -hmm. through architectural drawing and illustrating the nature of the community that exists within this small terrace on the estate. And mm -hmm. so it's very much about giving individuals the opportunity to do what is both mm -hmm. within their skills, but also what interests them um, and obviously now it's it's even more sort of extreme in the sense that everybody's just working from home. Uh, we used to have, you know, we would ordinarily we'd have regular meetings where we'd be sharing things, and now those meetings are obviously happening online, which is less. I think it's less easy, and obviously the the mm. relationship with the residents is harder as well. Uh, mm. Having that having that connection has, has been difficult. Um, um, but then you talked about yes, this nature of the roles. I think I think roles are still you know, roles do exist. I mean, ultimately, you know, somebody's paying for it. The, the issue, obviously, with the client and the user, is in a small architectural project, they tend to be the same person. You know, on a sort of residential project, um, and so that's much less difficult in terms of understanding what the brief is. Uh, and I think what we are trying to understand or trying to unpick is the conflict between potentially the um, um, the client and the user. There's different demands, different different um, different needs, different requirements, and uh, and I think that's that's at the heart of the, one of the biggest problems at the moment in estate regeneration is that the client uh, ultimately doesn't have the users the existing users' best interests at heart, unfortunately. And if the architect is uh, always contracted to the client and not the user then mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Um, so those contractual relationships, I think, are really important to interrogate and to try and imagine if there might be new ways. Uh, and it does come down to something in some ways, maybe as banal as a contract. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, there's also something very interesting to, to explore there. Yeah. And are you, do you find yourself um, inventing new forms of contract uh, um, um, to make things work? Yeah, I mean, I think... Quite often, our project, the projects we're doing are so fast. I mean, they're over in six months or not even. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, with the with the the amount of time we get to spend with residents, the the construction of a bespoke contract would probably take longer than that. <laughs> um, so it becomes it's 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 always a live changing work in progress rather than something which I think we've ever managed to find a discrete solution for that we can say, hey, here's a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's something that. Yeah, each one is is different essentially. Um, but yes, it's it's um, yeah, it's an area that certainly needs, needs investigation. I think yeah. Yeah. Um, like to invite people in the audience. Um, 
students. <laughs> I mean, I, I thank you very much for the for the presentation and the lecture. It was really inspiring. I have a a, a question that might sound technical, but mm -hmm. I I think it's it's something that we could also discuss, which is. When we're talking about demolitions and renovations, we are also somehow talking about material technologies and 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 uh, if you want the the any 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 attempt to reinvent this in a way we have also to confront uh, not the real estate forces of our business but also the construction monopolies yeah. and whatever uh, is associated with it. For example, you know standards. Um, uh, ISOs, whatever, I mean, name it. Uh, even like, I would say even uh, often uh, standards of comfort within buildings uh, could be challenged. Uh, ideas about what is environmentally acceptable. So I was wondering how in your work you were able to uh, tackle issues like that, uh, from the resources of mm. materials to, let's say, reinventing uh, parameters of design and, and of, uh, standards. Yeah, I think the question about refurbishment and how, um, I mean, for example, to go back to that one image uh, that the councillor tweeted, you know, look at the extent of the mould, this place needs to be demolished. And I think um, obviously there is work to be done in addressing the, the qualities of existing buildings and making sure that they are fit. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm positive that there's nothing about a building in terms of its environmental qualities that would, need, that would, that would not be able to be addressed. Um, with some form of retrofitting or refurbishment. Um, I mean, we don't have the capacity to um, be started doing material testing, you know, um, exploring the details within things like building regulations, I imagine you're also talking about. Um, I mean, I think we would love to be able to do that, but I think there are, I mean, I think there's a, you know, the, the retrofitting is now becoming more of a big deal. Um, so I think there are going to be more and more organisations who are looking at this, recognising that we can't go on demolishing buildings anymore. And so we're going to have to be looking at intelligent, affordable. So, of course, these, these mechanisms and solutions have to be cheap. Um, I mean, that combination of affordable, uh, you know, fire resistant, as we've seen from Grenfell, you know, the problems with refurbishing something, um, you know, without addressing um, absolutely fundamental requirements of building regulations is just kind of un obviously unacceptable. Um, so, yeah, we need to be we need to make sure that anything that we do obviously addresses these things. I don't think we we we're, as a uh, as an organization, we're not really in a position to be looking at uh, to be challenging. I think, you know, um, building regulations or um, I mean, I'd say, for I mean, in terms of t material technologies, for example, things like if you're working on a council estate where um, people are going to be living in their homes throughout the construction, things like speed of construction, um, uh, noise, uh, lack of pollution, dust, um, and things like that, obviously, you know, point towards prefabrication. Um, and so very much, you know, for me, methods of construction and materials are very much bound up around the, uh, the context. Um, and so they're very much embedded within the way in which we think. Um, so any of any of the things that we propose would have some of those that thinking in place. I don't think we've probably gone far enough yet in terms of being able to really identify um, that level of construction. I mean, on the whole, the work we're doing is only to a, a viability stage. Um, so it's kind of a master planning exercise on the whole that we do. We've done, although we have to get we have to be able to demonstrate that this is buildable. That it's viable. That you, so, in order to get to that point, you have to identify materials. You have to show that the walls are thick enough, you know, to be able to achieve building regulations and so on and so forth. Um, but yes, I mean, I think it would be great to be able to push this to the next level. Um, I don't think, as an organisation, and the speed at which we have to work, because we're working to a timetable which is essentially um, a developer's timetable, which has been set probably four or five years ago. Um, and so the nature of being up against time means that we're very happy to have the efficient with the work that we do. Right. What are the absolute requirements? What are the outputs that we need to produce to be able to make the argument? Um, so we don't have a huge amount of time to go down other um, tangents, I suppose. But we'd love to. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Any more questions? 
Um, I would like to ask because now you have said this like you all, you do mainly the master plan mm -hmm. and on if the plan is accepted so in a way you you manage to change what it's like the previous plan do you follow the process in order like also to in a way um, ensure that the plan is going to be developed as uh, as your proposal and also because in a like in order to help the neighbors um, so which is kind of the uh, your role during the whole process of our uh, yeah exactly i mean we we are generally working we're generally brought on by the residents to uh um to contest their estate getting demolished so at the moment all we're all we're doing is trying to stop demolition happening so uh plans have yet been taken forward to become the future of those estates um, and on the whole, our relationship in the past has been quite antagonistic with the local authorities. Um, the residents are our clients in a sense, but the residents don't have, aren't the ones with the money, they don't own the land. So it's a, it's a kind of an interesting sort of position that we're in and we haven't so far been in a position to take forward those proposals. Although the council have taken them forward, but with other people. So we haven't, we have no, we have no kind of role um, in that. In, in, in the process moving forward at the moment so far. Okay. And um, are you thinking, so do you think that it's possible also to consider this kind of new role in further phases? Definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, um, I think part of the issue as well is that uh, most local authorities, for example, we're working with the scale of, uh, I mean, 760 homes on St. Raphael's estate, it's a very large council estate. And on the whole, I imagine that for, um, in order to be the architect that works on those projects, you need to have a, an income, a turnover of over a million pounds. So there's certain levels that which you need to be acceptable within the kind of architectural world. Um, and we don't come up, we, don't, we wouldn't uh, be on their framework, for example. So there's lots of hurdles to get to before you're able to engage on that level, I think, uh, and take the project further. So we're a bit, we're rather young. I was thinking because, because for example, here in Barcelona, there is, uh, in even in our case, for example, so in some uh, cases we have been uh, hired by the municipality, so by the public sector, hmm. in order to, in a way, be a kind of the, the, um, the mechanism that uh, allows the neighborhood to understand the plan, even in a way to check and participate. So not to be the architect who develops, but sometimes even to define the criteria for a public competition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I think not, it could yeah. be strange not to be in this double position. It's kind of a yes. I think that, 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 well, I think what you're talking about there is potentially to be the role of the uh, uh, um, to be partly that the consultants or to be consulting with the residents. I think I think there's a certain danger in a way again. Um, in some of those projects and that you could be facilitating or manufacturing consent. I think there's a there's again who are you who's employing you and what are you employed to do? Are you employed to to massage a project through or are you employed really as the um, on behalf of the residents really to see their interests follow through? And I think again that comes down to the contract. It comes down to the relationship of the architect to the individuals in that process. Um, and what the question is, is, is the brief really open? You know, if you were to say, if you're working with the residents and the residents say, no, we really don't want that there, is that a possible future? Or actually, do they ever have really that amount of agency within that process? Um, maybe they do in some cases, maybe in your case, if you had discovered this was really unacceptable to the residents and you'd fed that back, would that have had um, any effect? Or would it have been massaged underneath and uh, um, not tolerated? So I think over, on the whole over here, the demand for land is so powerful that uh, the residents might get a choice on what color of front door they have, or maybe the material of you know, this and that. Um, but ultimately the real questions around um, tenure type you know, and demolition altogether um, are very rarely open questions. They're very rarely up for grab. Thank you. Thank you for a very um, 
intense, uh, very powerful talk. You're very, obviously very passionate about what you um, discussed and what you do. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions. So, and one relates to um, actually your title and the title of your forthcoming book, mm. and term socialist. And I must um, preface this with um, that I come from um, ex Yugoslavia and uh, socialism that was um, often described as um, a communism with a human face. Mm. Um, and also, my PhD was on Soviet or. Um, um, drawings, the unbuildable, mm. um, and you, when you discussed it, you also said how you do not wish to refer to the past examples, but actually to the future. But um, um, uh, can you do so if we still use the same terms mm. uh, with so many connotations and so much heavy burden? Um, is it still useful? Um, I mean, even in terms of uh, at the current times, in terms of uh, the current uh, epidemic, uh, instead of um, physical distancing, we have social distancing. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, so my question is, uh, my second question relates to the um, current pandemic and um, how and uh, what you think, um, and if um, um, will uh, change uh, in terms of social housing um, in a more permanent sense? Mm. Or do you think the changes are kind of uh, maybe quite abrupt, but not necessarily here to stay? Mm. Okay, two very good questions. Um, and I suspected I might get those slightly. Um, I mean, socialists, yes, we had this when we talked in Vancouver, and this was also brought up, um, why the insistence on the use of this word. And, and I think the point is not that we don't want to refer to the past. Uh, obviously, we can learn from it. I think that's very important that we learn from it. I think all words change in their, within their context. Um, and I think to some extent, it's also up for us to reclaim these words if they still have value to us. There is a value in that word uh, and what the, and the connotations of that word that I believe in very strongly, um, just because other people have associated that word with other things that have taken other meanings doesn't necessarily mean that for me that word has lost its value. Um, I mean, that's the only thing I can argue. I mean, I say that there's nothing else. There's no other word that I can think of that kind of describes what I believe the relationships need to be to produce a healthy, happy world. There isn't a word yet. It seems to be the most convenient, most appropriate, the closest word that comes to the kind of nature of the relationships that I think need to happen. That doesn't mean to say that, I mean, the word capitalism has also changed in its meaning and its use over the last you know, 150 years. Um, but it's, it, and it can tolerate movements. I mean, Catholicism, you know, the church has also changed enormously, but that doesn't mean to say people stop believing in it. Uh, what it what it means, it, well, I, I mean, it, people have stopped believing in it, but at the same time, if you look at the states now, there's also a massive resurgence within sort of socialist ideas, um, possibly partly because there hasn't been something else which has come along instead. Um, I mean, I suppose there's people talking about, um, yeah, I, I, there isn't another word, I suppose, quite simply, that um, does what I think, what that means for me. Um, and I suppose maybe we need to interrogate a bit more what that means for architecturally. I mean, what I'm trying to do, it's a socialist architecture that we're talking about. And I think it's really about trying to understand that it's a series of processes um, that are about the way in which you produce something. Um, and I think it is about maybe de disconnecting it from some of the negative uh, uh, um, stereotypes. I mean, like council housing also has lots of negative stereotypes associated with it. So then why do we want to continue to produce something which people think is, uh, you know, has no value. So again, it's about, I suppose, about refocusing value where we, where we see it. And I think reusing of that word is about saying, well, look, these things are important. 
I mean, the social distancing, I find kind of, yeah, it's nothing social about that distancing. It's a, well, it has become a social distance, but it's a physical distancing. And I, I, I'm not sure, I haven't really thought very much, to be honest, about that particular phrase. Um, I think in terms of the pandemic, um, and um, I think, I mean, my main issue is that, um, okay, two things. Um, the difference in life expectancy depends on where you live, before, even before the pandemic. For me, the pandemic hasn't actually changed anything. Um, uh, you know, there's 10 years difference in life, the life expectancy of somebody living in the poorest uh, um, uh, areas in the UK and the richest areas in the UK. This hasn't changed that. This is exactly, this is the, the people in those areas will be affected in the same way now as they were five years ago. The average life expectancy of a homeless person is 49 years old. So how are they affected by this, where the average age of somebody dying uh, with COVID or whatever is, is, is nearly 80? You know, so I think for me, this is kind of missing, you know, the points that we've been making all the way along are exactly the same points now as they, as they have been. Uh, people from poorer communities are, more, are much more affected uh, by this. Uh, and what this has exposed is the appalling way in which we, we treat, um, you know, the elderly fundamentally and um, people um, who are living in poorer environments. But that has always been an our issue. So in a way, for me, this has not changed anything in terms of the, the, the pressures that we would be putting on. Um, I personally don't think this is going to make anything. I don't think there's going to be, uh, you know, that I would be lucky to see any improvements. I imagine this is just actually going to make things a hell of a lot worse. We're going to be selling off the NHS faster. Um, there's, I think, uh, Jem Rick, um, the Secretary of State, has for a... Uh, um, Department for uh, Communities and Local Housing. I think he said there's going to be 6,000 new homes for the homeless. Um, well, we'll have to wait and see. We also know that like a couple of days ago, um, in order to um, facilitate development, the SIL in Section 106 was, uh, was dropped from developers, which basically means they don't have any obligation now to provide, to be producing any more affordable housing or be providing any, any uh, uh, you know, money going towards local facilities. So that's already been removed. So we're already worse now than we were three months ago as a result of this. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is just going to get much, much worse. Economically, this is, we're going to be, we're heading for another 10-year, um, you know, kind of at least 10-year kind of uh, a depression. And in terms of the effect that that's going to have, I, I can't see any more social housing being produced as a result of this under the current government. So no, I'm pretty pessimistic about that, to be honest. I mean, what we've seen in the past from so-called crises is that, um, you know, vulture capitalists capitalize on it. Uh, you know, what, I'm, what we're going to be seeing is a lot of people being evicted. We're going to be seeing a huge amount more homelessness. We're going to be seeing a lot more unemployment. And uh, we're going to see inequalities increasing, uh, unfortunately, from this. Uh, that's my... That's my rather negative um, anticipation. Maybe in other countries might be different. Maybe maybe more socialist in my depiction. You know, countries with more of a social uh, agenda might come out of this in a different way, but not the UK that I can imagine. I'm afraid. <laughs> but in the short, short term, there have been some improvements to uh, homeless. Um, small, small, but uh, some yeah. have been given hotel and um, other accommodation. Yeah, for the duration of yes. the... Yeah. And then they're being thrown back on the streets now. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think a lot of the time these these gifts are given, and even like, you know, even the financial kind of, uh, the furlough and so on and so forth, these kind of, well, that's fantastic, you know, I'm, this is really helping. But ultimately what we're going to be going into is, is an, another 10 years of austerity where, you know, essentially, you know, we all end up paying for huge economic kind of uh, uh, um, the vast um, um, shift again and this will also be the most the people who already have the most money will come out of this um, much much stronger and the, and the people with the least will come out with less I mean that is just unfortunately within this economic context that's what seems to happen I don't know I don't have an answer as to how that needs to change unfortunately the opposition we don't really have a government at the moment so <laughs> um, 
I suppose part of our process is about changing things from within the capacity that we have. So within the capacity as architects, what can we do? Um, you know, can we engage with different ways of practicing? You know, can we engage with different forms of planning, for example? Can we engage with different forms of uh, working with uh, uh, local bodies of residents to start to take a certain amount of agency over their local environment? I suppose in a sense, like, you know, if you try and change the world, you're going to get pretty depressed. If you start to engage with the, 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 the things that you can have some influence over, the skills that you have, then it's not going to be big. But I think little bit by little bit, you have at least more capacity for changing something. So I think, yeah, that's the process. The smaller process is kind of what we're trying to achieve rather than big change, I suppose. We have some uh, questions from the YouTube channel. Um, shall I pass them to you? Yeah. Sure, yeah. So, yes, we have uh, we have actually three questions from Vasav, who is a former student of ours. Mm. Uh, so the first question is, given the current time and future norms, could the relationship between uh, co-living and co-working be achieved uh, in these estates uh, through your uh, retrofitting and refurbishment process? That's one question. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, another question about uh, community ownership uh, uh, and other, let's say, forms and concepts uh, are, like, such as community kitchens mm -hmm. uh, and, I guess, collective uh, equipments. And the mm -hmm. third question is about uh, some sort of self-sustaining systems uh, of resident-run, uh, let's say, processes. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about this? Well, I mean, interestingly, so the um, the community ownership, well, West Kennan Gibbs Green estate, uh, there are two estates, and so they actually um, set up what this, uh, one, one of the ones that I talked about, set up this um, uh, community land trust, which was um, West Kennan Gibbs Green Community Homes. And the intention there was to uh, transfer the estate into their, ownership, into their own ownership. So they would then be in control of... Um, managing the estate. They'd be managing the development of it, but also managing then the, the ongoing refurbishments, uh, you know, for the next however, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so yes, I think that's absolutely possible. Um, there's another estate that we're working with, which I didn't mention, uh, I just didn't really have enough time, called the Patmore. And it's actually, it's an interesting um, example because it's a, it's a council estate in Wandsworth, but it's also cooperatively managed. Um, so essentially what that means is that there's a, there's a kind of co-op which is, has a resident board and they ultimately manage the day-to-day um, -day running of the estate. Not, they don't have control to um, do larger scale work, but um, the smaller scale work, they do have a um, certain amount of control. And that's about, I think it's 860 homes, that estate. So it's a big estate to manage um, collectively. Um, I suppose to talk about this idea of collective management and ownership, there is a scale there which I think is interesting. Um, where can you hold a meeting which holds 800 people? That's uh, that's uh, 800 homes. So sorry, that's more like sort of two and a half, three thousand people. Uh, you know, when we talk about sort of collective ownership and collective management, how do you engage as an individual within that process of management, within that running? Um, and I think that's a question that I think somehow is a question of scale um, and I think any organization which would want to be looking at how you do that would need to address that sort of form of scale um, and the kind of decision making processes that go into that because I think that's complex um, and obviously the larger it is the more complex it becomes. Um, in the Patmore estate one of the things that we identified was that there had been um, these small laundry rooms in each block. There was about 30 blocks in the estate and there'd be these small laundry rooms. And of course, once everybody had their own washing machines and so on, the laundry rooms went out, fell into disuse. But of course, the laundry rooms didn't only provide washing. They were also a social space. Um, and one of the problems were over the, this estate is in the middle of the um, Battersea, Vauxhall Battersea Nine Elms Opportunity Area, which is where Battersea Power Station is. So it's you know, one of the most kind of one of the biggest developments in the whole of Europe at the moment. Um, and so they asked us to come help them put together a kind of an alternative plan for their, uh, the future of their estate. And one of the things we identified was the lack of community spaces. They've had their community hall taken away from them. 
Um, so they, they don't have anywhere to access. The only place they have to meet is one of these little laundry rooms, which is you can, you can have about 20 people in there. So how do you manage an estate with, only, with a room which can only fit in 20 people? How do the other 1,000, you know, 800, 2,000 people feel like they are part of that collective um, community? I think that's difficult. But so one of the things we proposed was that we would transform all of these um, individual um, laundry rooms into uh, social spaces, which would be managed by the residents. So each block will potentially have a kind of management um, team which would be in charge of what happened in that space. And that might be a permanent uh, kind of soup kitchen, for example, a uh, place where people could be learning to cook and eating and there'd be a little cafe. Um, uh, there were all sorts of residents came up to us with all sorts of ideas. One wanted it to be sort of community hairdressing. Somebody else wanted it to be about dog grooming. And there was a whole list of things that residents would have loved to have been able to do to take over these spaces. So I think the, the de desire is there. Um, and the idea they could also be co-working, you know, sort of working spaces as well. Um, the desire was there. I suppose there was always a need for money. And so we're at the stage now where we were about to get this proposal and go to places that is a good growth fund or something which would be about looking for some funding to support some of these um, some of these projects. The other question I think you asked, you asked was about co-living and co-working. I mean, was this within the context of the COVID situation? Is that what, sorry, is that what the... The question was, is I, it in the current situation? No, no, I think, I think it's uh, independent of, uh, okay. of the current crisis. I think it's more about uh, spaces, protocols uh, of symbiotic relationship between working and living. Yeah. I have to say I'm very skeptical of this sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to this kind of uh, uh, estates in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I'm reading at the moment, I'm rereading, um, you know, Uses of Disorder by Richard Sennett and, you know, this, uh, this, 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 this sort of sense that Spaces of conflict are important. Spaces of co-living, co-working, those kind of spaces are places of conflict. I mean, for example, we're working with a, we were working with a co-op called The Drive up in uh, Walthamstow, which was a co-housing project um, with, currently with 11 residents, and they wanted to double it in size to 20, both to uh, provide additional housing for people, but also to bring the rents down and to make a sort of sustainable living space. So this was very much a co-housing co project. Um, and I think the, the benefits of that are amazing because you're obviously sharing facilities, which means you can suddenly then have more things. So, you know, uh, you've got one kitchen between, uh, one large kitchen between eight people, which means you've then got space for maybe a music room or a, uh, a sort of working from home space or a larger garden. So there's a huge amount of benefits to get to gain from the co-living uh, um, situation, but you know they met every week. They had they were all, it was a mutual uh, um, um, uh, sorry the, yeah it was, a, it was a, as a co-op they collectively owned it and um, um, they made decisions um, uh, by consensus. So you know in order to have a consensus decision making process, everybody had to be there. Um, so there's a huge amount of time was taken up with the simple running of the place, um, which, if you're engaged with that, is amazingly fulfilling. Uh, but I think that not everybody is necessarily in a position to do that. But if you want to, you know, if you if you want to engage with that, then you do have to engage with it 100%. You can't just be a kind of observer as part of those processes. So again, that comes down to scale. Ten people, yes. Twenty people, again, is at the limits. I think of probably what you can engage with. Uh, in terms of a room, in terms of decision making, to come to a consensus um, is going to be that much harder. So again, as you start scaling up, um, I think Radical Roots is part of a kind of uh, the early co-ops. They talked about scale as well as being a kind of very fundamental in terms of different scales of different communities. So when you're looking around things like co-living, um, I think it can be very beneficial, but I, I think it's very much about the um, the relationships between them and, and, the, and the sort of element of choice and why it's being done and for whom again because um, we can all be, we also see it as being a kind of a mechanism for people to just make more money with less space so <laughs> um, you know the kind of examples of what the collective or whatever it's called um, I don't see those as being potentially you know other, anything other than massive opportunities to make profit um, although they seem to be this kind of wonderful you know, sharing 
community. I think it's it's very careful. I think we've got to be careful about the ways in which these ideas are co-opted very easily um, and and profited from. And we've got to be careful about those lines between the different um, the different ways in which these ideas are carried through. I suppose. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, please? Hi, thank you very much for, for the lecture. Super interesting. I would like you to elaborate uh, a little bit more on the idea of negotiation between the different um, stakeholders, be these local communities slash dwellers, technicians, among which architects and the administration, and the fact that even though this may be very enriching, since you collect many different voices in the process of decision making, yeah. administration many times seeks a more um, simplified process, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, yeah for the sake of efficiency or speed or, you know, uh, rapid profit or yeah. uh, be able to fulfill uh, political uh, schedules of four years rather than understanding the city as a process that will take like a long, of, a lot of years to um, be finished if it's ever finished any part of the city. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, it's um, all these things are conflicts. You know, there's always uh, conflicts between different demands. So you were talking about, about time demands. You have demands where things need to happen at a certain time scale, whether that's because of funding may run out, for example. Um, and I think the key thing really, I mean, this goes back to an earlier thing I was thinking about in terms of co-production. You know, co-production is a really big sort of phrase nowadays in terms of producing things with residents, um, for example. And... I think um, one of the key issues is about um, respect, ultimately. You know, I don't think it necessarily has to be, we don't have, not everything has to be about co-production. You know, I mean, yeah, the, the West Kenner Gibbs Green uh, was in very labor intensive. It was, you know, we, we spent huge amount of time working with, you know, with 200 individual people over the space of, you know, six months to a year in order to get uh, a, the, you know, the kind of level of understanding that we, that we, that we, that we really wanted to. Um, but most people, most people really don't have the time or the financial opportunities to do that. Um, and I think that when I've, I've been thinking about this and thinking about what is that really about? You know, what is this idea of co-production? You know, when you're an individual client with an architect, you don't co-produce your design you tell the architect what you want. I want my kitchen. I want a kitchen, and then you let them do the you let them do the job, and then they come back after how many. And, and yes, there's the there is definitely a relationship there. There's an ongoing um, evolution of the brief, but there there isn't the same sense of the need for co-production as there is on larger scale projects. And I think what that comes down to, in terms of my understanding of it, is that actually the desire for that is that is, is the client or the resident really expressing the fact that they feel they have no agency in this process. If I think they felt that, um, that really the, the local authority, for example, or the developer or the landlord had their best interests at heart, then the desire would be, I think it's so much about a lack of trust, you know, and I think the lack of trust has meant that, um, because you're right, there are, there are time constraints on things. I mean, I think, you know, this does, I mean, partly what I'm suggesting is it does does rethink the way in which we engage with those time pressures. I mean, yes, I'm being kind of, you know, very ambitious, but, you know, the idea that actually, you know, these are much slower, more ongoing processes. Um, and yes, that does involve a very different kind of thinking about the way in which we develop. But I think that the way we go forward, we're going to have to do that anyway. I think in terms of kind of relationships of degrowth, I think that we just can't continue to be working at the same levels of speed and so on that we have been doing in the past. Because also the thoughtlessness with which I think things are produced at that speed um, and the waste that is produced while working at those kind of speeds, I think is actually part of the problem. So firstly, I would say that slowing down is kind of going to be inevitable if we're going to be producing a really sustainable kind of development process. This is globally or whatever you want to call it or locally. Um, so as soon as you do start to slow down, then I think various people are going to be more, feel more engaged. People are going to be able to contribute more to that process in a way which isn't felt like that you've got half an hour on a Saturday afternoon to go and look at the models and make your comment on a piece of sticky paper, stick it on the wall. And that's your contribution to the future of your 
home. So I think, you know, I think a lot of things would settle down if the timescales were slowed. Um, I suppose that comes back then to the conflict of interest, which ultimately, you know, if the developer has decided they want to demolish this, um, your, ha your home or your estate or that school or whatever, um, for reasons that are not in the best interests of the local community, i.e. for profit, then there has got to be a change um, on a more political level that means that that can't happen. Um, you know, I mean, otherwise, those decisions will always be made and the power of the agency will never be in the hands of the person who is directly affected. Um, and that has to come out through a fundamental change of whether that's around the planning system, whether it's around um, making things actually just less profitable, less viable. So you're looking at sort of land value taxes, which really mean that actually power is so unevenly distributed within these processes um, that, I mean, is it really negotiation? Not really, I think. You know, in most cases, the decision is already made and you're negotiating around the edges of something. Um, so the question really is, how do you enable it to be a genuine kind of negotiation when each party has a similar amount of power and agency within the decision-making process. So I think that would probably be my answer. Um, because at the moment it's so imbalanced that, you know, no matter how good your argument is, unless um, you manage to shift that power or unless you demonstrate, so, unless, I mean, when you look at the power at the moment within um, the difference between local authorities and, for example, housing associations, housing associations uh, have a like Guinness Trust, for example, or Peabody, they have a um, 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 their sort of branding is something which is of great importance to them. Um, so, you know, when, when, um, when residents or council estates uh, challenge them, um, those housing associations kind of have more of an obligation to listen because they're like, oh, we, we really do not want our our brand associated with this negative publicity. So again, I suppose it's about looking at, I mean, that, that shouldn't be a form of negotiation, but in a sense, it often does become one. Because what does the resident who has no money, no financial investment in this and no real power, what kind of power do you have within your kind of social and political environment? And I suppose that this, these now, these forms of negotiation are playing out within people trying to identify what kind of power they have within the situation that they find themselves in. So that's kind of a strange answer to your question, I think, but <laughs> I hope that was useful. Hello, Hello. Uh, Hello. thank you uh, very much for, the, for, the, for presenting a solid project that uh, Ash is uh, moving uh, forward. I think, I think Based on your presentation, we also can see the the effects and influences that Ash has on individual projects and the fate of uh, estates that you have presented. Uh, but I think I can also see the effects that your work is having in 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 changing the discourse in 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 wider sense, kind of giving a very solid examples for people who want to, you know, follow uh, uh, follow uh, follow the roots of uh, doing infill housing. Uh, opposed a state regeneration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I can see that uh, your propaganda uh, project uh, is 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 kind of changing the discourse, even in in the in the in the level of uh, borrows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so thank you very much for that. Firstly, but um, but basically, mainly the question. My question is really about agency, which you've been uh, referring to um, correctly quite a lot. And I think the very uh, well. The question is uh, your opinion about the agency that uh, an architect, uh, or arch well, at 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 different levels, either architecture student, uh, a, a an architect working for uh, an architectural firm uh, at a different level, working for these developers who are tr basically planning to move things forward. Um, do you see them having a a fundamentally different agency or can be a can be able to have a different agency beyond their an individual person 
if yeah, that's my question. Really. So I think what you're saying, I mean, yeah, I suppose part of the point is that we as individuals have agency aside from the fact of us being architects. So, you know, even if you are a resident on or, or a neighbour to a housing campaign, you could get involved in that campaign and you could engage with that. I think the agency, um, yes, I think each, I mean, I think like with anything, everybody has their own individual capacity for agency. Um, um, and... I mean, it's difficult. I think within within a job, you have a certain agency and, and ability. I mean, like, so the kind of work that we do in terms of convincing, like, a local authority that, you know, that demolition is just unviable, you know, that is coming from the role of an architect. It could be, you know, if we were employed by them, that's the role, the role of an architect to a client. I mm -hmm. suppose that's probably, in terms of the architecture, in terms of the agency, that's one of the highest levels of agency because you are given an authority agency is also about authority isn't it so yeah. what authority do you have how much authority is invested is vested in you by the people that you are trying to have trying to exit within the context within which you're trying to exercise your agency so i mean interestingly when we the first project we did with um with ash was with the knight's walk and it's just a local uh, estate to where i live it's on the same estate that i live on effectively and um, the residents had been trying to get to the table with the council and the council had just not been interested. They're like, you know, why should we listen to you? Well, no, they were listening to them within the concepts of the consultation, but they weren't really sitting down and listening to them saying, look, we want you to explore alternatives. And they weren't listening. Mm. But as soon as we were brought on board, because we were architects, suddenly we had a certain authority, which meant that the local authority was obliged in a way to listen to us. Um, so I think, I suppose, the agency of any individual is in direct relationship to its perceived authority, perhaps. So if you're, if you're an individual working for a, an architectural organisation, how much agency do you have within that organisation to change the direction of that organisation? A small amount, you know, maybe one person. If you have a, a larger group of you, if there's 10 of you working within that organisation to kind of put pressure on the, um, the lead the lead architects or whatever to sort of like actually to change the direction yeah you have a certain amount of uh, of opportunities to do that and again it goes back in a way i think to what i was saying earlier about you know it's not about changing trying to change the world from up here it's about little bit by little bit in whatever capacity you have to make those changes and um i mean you know uvw um has now a new architectural workers union so, you know, again, you know, more agency in, in mass, you know, one individual has less uh, uh, power than 10 individuals repeating something than 100. So, when, you know, when you would imagine something like the RBA should therefore have more agency or more power in terms of representing the voice of the architect or the you know, architecture um, than a few individuals. But then, um, I don't know, I don't have much of an opinion of the RBA at the moment. Um, but, yeah, I think it's really just about seeing the agency in the position that you've got and being imaginative. You know, I think giving agency to others is also incredibly valuable. So part, I suppose, of what when we're doing these projects, which is about, you know, um, as I said to the chap of the guy before about um, trust, you know, and the residents, you know, having completely lost trust, but also feeling completely disempowered. Uh, you know, they're like, we're going to demolish your home whether you like it or not. And that is a feeling of, uh, that's just, um, uh, that feeling of disempowerment is, is horrific. And so part of the agency is about taking that power back, is about understanding. So helping people to understand what is going on. The more you can understand the system, the system, the more you can engage with it. So if you understand that this is how the planning system works, for example, this is how you can engage with that planning as an argument, the more you can give that power and that agency to as many other people as possible, again, the more collective, I suppose, um, um, possibilities there are. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a question that we always get, because, I, but I think that if you don't take the agency, if you don't take a position and you don't say anything and don't do anything, then of course you're gonna go nowhere. If you do, then it's only gonna be better. You know, I mean, as you say, even in the last five years or something, just our voice has started to maybe, you know, you've, you've said you think it might have had an effect. 
mm-hmm. you know, and that's a few people who made the decision to say, right, okay, this is not acceptable, and to push a few buttons. And everybody's capa- everybody's capable of doing that, you know. Um, but it does take time, and it takes commitment, and it takes support. Um, but ultimately, it takes a real determination to do it. But everybody does have that, uh, you know, capacity within them to do it. Um, and the more, you know, if nobody stands up, then really nothing will change. But individually, two people, three people, five people becomes a movement, you know. And I do believe it. I do. I mean, although, as I said earlier, I think things are getting worse. <laughs> um, I do still. I'll still be. I'll still be be saying this because. Um, I just don't think I could do anything else, you know. I think it's, um, um, you still fight, even if you feel like you're losing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, because I just think it's a long game, you know. I don't think this is happening. It's not going to be, we're not going to be winning this in the next, you know, year or two years. It's a much bigger project than that. So um, we just have to be determined, fight on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Next question. Um, great, thank you. Um, I, I think um, we should, in a way, um, draw this public session to an end. Um, sure. And um, so it's been really tremendous. And uh, we would like to invite you to, um, in with after a bit of a break, uh, just for a short uh, seminar session with the uh, with the Projective City students in the Projective City room um but uh, maybe in, in about um let's say at 12 o'clock or something um sure. but um right. yeah on behalf of the projected city thank you and thank you so much us. and uh, so you see you in a bit uh, we'll send you a link to the other space yeah. okay. okay thanks very much everybody bye-bye. thanks for the questions bye bye